Well, good morning. It is a it's a pleasure to be here this Sunday morning. Uh, we've my family and I have been in, back from Brazil for um, almost I guess almost seven eight months now, and uh, I'm a little bit sad because I haven't been here very much at all. Uh, so it's it's good to be here on a Sunday morning to to see my church family, and it's a it's an extra blessing to be able to to open up the Word of God together with you and and um, bring before you this this subject, this topic of of missions, and especially as we conclude our our uh, stewardship month, the idea of investing in in missions through faith promise offering. Um, as as you're going to see, I'm. I'm going to take a little bit of a long way to, to get to, to that aspect of it. But, you know, it's good for us to be reminded of things that are basic and, and, and are important, right? The Bible is a book full of um, repetition and an exhortation to remember the things that we've been taught and to um, hold on to the things that, that have been um, pointed out as as important to us and my my aim this morning is that by recalling what the great commission is and considering why we should prior prioritize it we'll be able to reconsider how we can participate in it and certainly giving through faith promise missions is is one area of that okay so let's Let's begin. We're gonna be we're gonna be all over the Bible, okay? So just if if my voice is too calm and and you're getting sleepy, just get keep your Bible on your lap or on your on your hand, however you do it, and just turn to the passages. You'll stay awake, I guarantee. Um, we'll we'll probably we'll be quite a bit in in Matthew chapter twenty eight. So if you want to turn there with me, um, give you a, a bit of a, a head start, and in fact. I'd like to go ahead and read Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through, through 20. <clears throat> In the gospel of Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 16, the word of God says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, this is, this is um, one of the, the main texts that we look at when we talk about the Great Commission. Um, what, what is the Great Commission? What, what is missions? Missions is a term that we use quite a bit, and uh, often we don't think very much about how we define it, but we all know what we mean, right? We all know what we mean. Um, this morning, I'd like to suggest to you that missions is the ongoing work of the Lord and his disciples through his churches to take the message of the gospel to every person for whom Christ died, and thereby advancing the kingdom of God by the self-perpetuating process of making disciples and organizing them into churches. Isn't that what we mean when we say missions? Amen. So I, I, I think it's worthwhile defining our terms sometimes. But we, we talk about missions. We talk about advancing the kingdom of God. Um, and, we, and we derive this idea really from the texts that we, that we talk about and call the Great Commission. Um, the passages specifically are Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Uh, Mark 16, 14 through 19. Luke 24. Um, verses 35 through 52, John chapter 20, 19 through 23, 
in Acts chapter number 1, verses 1 through 12. Uh, we're not going to go and read all those passages right now. Okay, we'll, we'll be touching on all of them at, at some point or another. But I want, you, I want to rem- remind you of some things that we probably already know. I want us to recall what it is that we're talking about. The, the Great Commission. These passages, um, they, they contain the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, They all have in common that they're words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Remember, Jesus had had, uh, died in Jerusalem. He had sacrificed himself for our sins and was buried. But he did not remain dead. He didn't stay buried in the tomb, but he was resurrected on the third day. And the Bible is um, very clear that that Jesus had some work left to do when he rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easy for me to, as I think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, I'm reading through my Bible in a year, it's easy to, to get the impression or to kind of uh, sort things out in, in, in my head to think, okay, so Christ rose from the dead and then he appeared to the, the, the apostles and he ascended into heaven. And all this happened, you know, that, that was like a Sunday night, right? Maybe, maybe you're not, you're not uh, guilty of that. But I think that it's easy to lose track of what actually took place in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses 3 through 8. Here the Apostle Paul, in that great chapter concerning the resurrection, um, lays out for us, a little bit of some of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ did before, after the resurrection, and before he ascended into heaven. Now, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren alone. No, five hundred brethren at once, excuse me. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as as, as one born out of due time. So the very last one actually happened after he had ascended into heaven. But all the other appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ happened after the resurrection and before the ascension. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, uh, give us a, a time frame in which all these appearances took place. And it wasn't just Sunday night. Um, the former tre- treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that which Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, speaking of his, his uh, gospel work, after his passion by, the many, by many infallible proofs being seen of them, Forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So here in this passage, we're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead on the third day, but it wasn't it wasn't an immediate departure into the presence of of, of his Father in heaven. In fact, he stayed around for forty days. Um, we we celebrate the or we we recognize the day of Pentecost, the day in which the the Lord Jesus Christ baptizes the church with the Holy Spirit because it's 50 days, Pentecost, after Passover. So if you're getting, getting the time frame together with me, the Lord Jesus Christ rose, rose from the dead. He spent time with his apostles and appeared to many people, and in fact, on one occasion, at least 500 people. And then he ascended to heaven, and the, the apostles, after waiting for 10 days, um, experienced the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all of this background information so we can 
we can grasp what is, what is going on here in the Great Commission. Because we are going to look at several of these passages. And I want you to understand that these, uh, this is not um, five different accounts of the same event. These, these are um, different occasions. Okay, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared after his resurrection. He appeared to the women right at, the, at his tomb. Um, and then later that evening, he appeared, appeared to the apostles. He also appeared to the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells his disciples to go before him into Galilee. And he's going he's gonna to meet him there. So Galilee was a, a, a decent journey from Jerusalem. It was probably about 100 miles, depending on exactly where they ended up in, in, uh, around the Sea of Galilee. But these are, these are different occasions, different uh, times that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his apostles. But he seemed to be dealing with the same, the same ideas each time. And it is important for us to note that each of the inspired writers that, that recorded the, the events of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ were moved by the Holy Spirit to include at the end, at the end of each one, this idea of what Jesus wanted to go on moving forward. <clears throat> so, now that we've established that, let's, let's go ahead and uh, move forward and, dis- and look at some of some of the passages that we that uh, we've listed, and uncover about five um, descriptions of what the Ho- what the Holy Spirit inspired the Great Commission to be. All right, you all are still there with me in Matthew chapter twenty eight. Maybe if you're not, get back to that place, Matthew chapter twenty eight, and verse number sixteen. The first, the first thing that we see concerning the Great Commission is that it was delivered to a certain group of people. You notice it says in verse number 16, it, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed him, had appointed them. Uh, we, we find the eleven disciples Present And in fact, in each one of the accounts of the Great Commission, there's a common group present. It's the, the apostles, or the apostles and, and some others that were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's often been discussed uh, by, by people who, who, uh, who study the scripture. They, they discuss, who, who was the Great Commission given to? And how, how does that influence what we ought to be doing? And there's one group of people who say, hey, that was for the apostles. It's th- the 11 were there, and the Lord Jesus Christ wanted his apostles to do this. And um, once they passed off the scene, they, it was done, and we need to be focusing on other things. That would be incorrect, wouldn't it? That would be, that'd be a wrong way of understanding it. He's addressing his 11 disciples, but as you see, he says in verse number 20, um, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The apostles didn't survive to the end. Their teaching did, inspired by the Holy Ghost. But the apostles themselves each died, and, and, uh, and many believe they died each as, as a martyr of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they all passed on. They, they had an appointment with death, just like each one of us do. But yet, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ was promised to remain with someone until the end. And there, there is a group of people in which the Lord Jesus Christ also promised to, to protect and pre- preserve. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock, speaking of, of his divine character, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He, he promised that the church that he was building, that he had built, 
would continue on through all of, all of time, though it would be oppressed and though there would be conflict, he would build it and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so when we compare scripture with scripture, we understand when the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to the 11 apostles, giving them this commandment in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he's delivering this commandment, this commission to his church. The Great Commission is delivered to the church. That's to the, the assembly of believers who have been baptized and united together in covenant. And truthfully, for the very purpose of fulfilling this Great Commission. So, it's a, the Great Commission is delivered to the church. There's not another um, group on earth today that has been authorized to fulfill the Great Commission, who has been promised the power and been promised the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ to see this commandment through until the very end. It's the church. It's you and I as members of Edmund Road Baptist Church. It, it applies to every New Testament church individually. We've been given the commandment to go, and we've been promised the resources to fulfill that task. <clears throat> and that brings me to the second point. The, the Great Commission is initiated and authorized by Christ himself. You see in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 28, the word of God says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The Lord Jesus Christ makes, makes this bold declaration that he has all the authority. All the authority. Power in this, in this case is authority. And as the Lord Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. He's, he is sovereign over all things. And here, especially as he's demonstrated his, his power over death, he comes to his disciples, to the apostles here, and he says, he says to them, first of all, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And in verse 19, you see that it says, go ye therefore. Why, why, do you, why is he making this statement after all power? Therefore, since I have all authority, this is what I'm telling you to do. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Also, we see in John chapter 20 in verse 1. Here, here is, um, again, this is a separate occasion, but it touches on the same idea. John chapter 20 and verse number 21 the Lord Jesus Christ is, is appearing to, to the apostles, and this is actually on, on the, the resurrection day. The Bible says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The Lord Jesus Christ says to his church, Peace be unto you. You, 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 can, you can have calmness of mind. You can stop worrying, being anxious. Remember how much anxiety there was for the apostles after the Lord was crucified? Right? Some, they, they all scattered. Some doubted. Um, they were locked up in a room. And here the Lord Jesus Christ says, Peace be unto you. And he makes this statement concerning what they were going to do moving forward. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So the implication is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ was sending them. He was sending them. He was giving them a purpose, and that purpose was going to be um, carried out in the same way in which the Father was with the Son. He was, he was present with his work, wasn't he? The Father approved of the Son. He said, 
This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased when the Lord Jesus Christ was, was uh, baptized. And the voice of, of, of a voice came from heaven um, testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ himself said, I'm doing the works of my father. I'm doing the things that he has sent me to do. And so in that same way in which the father sent the son and was with him in his work, so the Lord Jesus Christ says to his church, I'm sending you and I'll be with you. I'm, I'm in the midst of you. I'm working with you. You're, you're, you're going to do my purpose. You're going to go do my work. The, the Lord Jesus Christ said that he came not to do his own will. He came to do the will of his Father that sent him. And the, the testimony of the church should be, we're not here to do our own will. We're, we're here to do the will of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. The, the Great Commission is initiated and authorized by Christ. We, we depend on his authority to be able to, to uh, prosecute the work. And we, and we can trust in the, the promise of his presence to move forward. The, the Great Commission also assumes active advancement. Back with me to Matthew 28. I still see, I still hear some pages turning in the Bibles. I, I like that sound. I'm not, I'm not against looking at Bibles that don't make page flipping sounds. I think that's okay. But I, I'm, I just want to let you know that it's reassuring to me standing up here, hearing your Bible flipping from page to page. <coughs> the the Great Commission assumes active advancement. Uh, we've already we've already touched on this verse, but there's more here. Obviously, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right, now, now look um, at the end of the Gospel of Mark with me in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Here the, the scripture says, Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a similarity between those two verses, right? Um, there's an assumption that there will be an active advancement. Go ye. Go ye. It, it has the idea of, of moving forward. The Lord did not... Did not have in mind for the apostles and for his church to remain in, in Jerusalem forever, only looking inside and focusing on, on each other and on themselves. There is a season for waiting. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of my, my, my father come upon you. But there is going to be a time to go. And the Great Commission is a, is a commandment that can only be fulfilled by going it can't it can't be accomplished by sitting still you understand that there's there is a world that is waiting to hear the gospel they're not coming to us the great commission does not uh, does not uh, assume that lost people will be looking for us and, and seeking us out to to hear the gospel so we, we're, we know that God is at work in the hearts of people in the world, that he's, the, the Lord Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in the world today. The, the work of the church is not a work independent from God. It's a cooperation with God. We're working together with God. But our side of it is, involves going. And God's si side of it is, involves giving us the resources that we need, the grace that we need, and also working 
internally in the hearts of people in ways that we can't even see. But we have to be going. It's not enough to be, to be staying. So it, it assumes an act of advancement. And in fact, um, Acts 1.8, if you all want to look there with me, we see that there's some definition to this, this advancement. Acts chapter 1 and, and verse number 8. The word of God says. I'll wait for you all to get there. The word of God says. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here makes a, a declarative statement. This isn't a commandment here. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying, this is how it's going to This is how it's gonna be. You're going to wait here, but when, but when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Jerusalem, where they're at, this this is given this is taking place in Jerusalem not in Galilee you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea which is the surrounding area around Jerusalem Jerusalem's located in the province of Judea and in Samaria a little farther away where people aren't quite the same as they are and unto the uttermost part of the earth right it's it's these four different areas but you notice that there's an interesting word at the beginning of the text. It says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in. That, that assumes not a, not a progression. You don't get to mark off Jerusalem once you get Jerusalem done. And then, and then uh, you, or, and, and it doesn't assume that you work on Jerusalem, work on Jerusalem until you get it all taken care of and then you mark it off before you're allowed to move to Judea. This isn't like a video game. You have to beat Jerusalem level to go to, to Judea. You understand? You, you, the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, the way it's going to work is yeah, you're going to start here but you're going to spread out. And at the same time, as you're a witness here, you'll be a witness there, there, and there. And we see from this the idea of an, of an act of advancement that requires, that's going to require some cooperation, okay? Not, not all of us are going to, to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? Some of us might. I hope some of, it, some more, more of us will. I don't know if, if Brazil's the uttermost part of the earth or not, but it's far away from here. <laughs> um. But the idea is always moving forward, always going on, not stopping. You're not, not content with Jerusalem. You can't stay in Judea. Remember, that's, what, that's actually the history of the book of Acts, right? They kind of did that. They kind of were getting pretty comfortable in Jerusalem and Judea, and uh, there were some stirrings going on in Samaria, but... After that, there was a great persecution, and it and it caused them to go to all of these all of these areas all at the same time. And the gospel was going out from Jerusalem around the world, and the and help from around the world was coming back to Jerusalem. You can see that in the history of the New Testament. And so we see that that the Great Commission assumes active advancement. If we if we fail to move forward then we, we're, we are stalling. We're not taking care of the commission as we ought to. Think about, think about the, the plan of God as it's adapted. Remember in the Old Testament, the, the question was, where will God put his house? Where will God dwell, right? He, he told the nation of Israel to build him a tabernacle, and, and the tabernacle contained the most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence dwelt, right? If you, wanted to, if you wanted to experience the presence of God, where did you go? 
he went to the tabernacle. And the nation of Israel was to be a witness to all of the nations around about them. And they were to, to, to declare the glory of God to, to the nations that were, were uh, there in the land. But things changed. The Lord Jesus Christ came and he, he uh, spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, right? And she had a, a, question, of, a question for him about where's the right place to worship God? Do we worship in Jerusalem where the temple is? Or do we worship here where our traditions say that we're supposed to worship God? And Jesus said, the day's coming, now is, where they, they that worship me will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it's not going to be in Jerusalem or in this mountain, it, it will be It'll be wherever there are people united with, with uh, true hearts seeking God. And it's a foretelling of what he was doing. He was building his church. And the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where the presence of God is. You don't, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go to Edmond, Oklahoma. The, the church, the Holy Spirit, dwells in a special way when the church is united together. The Spirit of God lives in every side of, inside of every believer, okay? But in a special way, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is declared to be the house of God. And so, the, it's, it's shifted. Before it was come to where the presence of God is, now... The Lord Jesus Christ is saying to, to the church, go to where the people need the presence of God. It's a, it's a reversal. All right. We're moving right along. There, the Great Commission involves two imperatives. Okay? You all still, still with me, Matthew 28? We're still in verse number 19. Matthew 20, 28, verse 19, I'm going to read it again. And it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and again, in Mark chapter 16, 15, uh, he, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Within these two uh, sections of scripture, we find two commandments, two imperatives. Often when we read it, we think that the commandment is to go, right? And that's a, that's a reasonable um, idea. But if we, if we dig into it a little bit more, we might, what we'll discover is that it's assumed that we will be going. We're going to have to be going to fulfill what is actually being commanded. And the commandment in verse 20, the, the imperative verb, which involves commandment, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 is found in the phrase, uh, teach the first teach teach all nations um, this is a a special um, type of teaching that comes from this word uh, the the greek word is matateo which comes from the the word mathetes which means disciple okay mathetes means disciple and matateo it has it has to do with Making a disciple or, or instructing a person to become a disciple. And that's why we have teach all nations. This is a commandment. It's not a, it's not a suggestion. But in fact, it is something that is required in the Great Commission. The following phrase, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and uh, in the next verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. These are, these, this is describing how are we going to go about teaching all nations. Well, it's, it's implied that we, that we have to incorporate them into a church. We, they have to be initiated, if you will, through baptism. Baptism is a step that a person takes 
when they have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they want to demonstrate to the world that they, in fact, associate themselves with Christ. Now, we, we, we lose a little bit of that now because um, when we're baptized, often in a, in a church among, among uh, fellow believers like we have here, which I think this is good, who wants to go be baptized outside today? What about last Sunday? Right? There's, there's good reasons for that. But in the past, when, when you associated yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ through baptism, you were going, you were going out into the public and you're having this act performed on you, right? You don't baptize yourself. Someone baptizes you. You place yourself under the authority of that, of that person or the, or the representative of that group. And you associate yourself with Christ and with that church. In fact, the Bible teaches that, that the Holy Spirit uses baptism to, to join us together as a body. And so we, we're, gonna, we're going to teach all nations by bringing them into fellowship with the church. And then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Right? Right? This is a different type of teaching. This is more of what we think about um, sitting down, opening the Bible, and saying, look, this is what the Bible says. What are we going to do about that? Okay, Because it is teaching them to observe. It's not teaching them all of the, all of the information that the Bible contains. It's not, it's not adding up facts and figures about the geography of the Bible. These things are important to understanding the Word of God. But if we know all about the Bible, but we never obey what Jesus has said, we're, we're not doing well. We're not doing well at all. In fact, we're res- we, we become more and more responsible the more we learn and more and more culpable when we disobey or we choose not to apply. It might, might be another way of, of saying it. We know what we ought to do. We know what the Bible says. But we still say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to allow that to change my life. That becomes problematic. So the, these, this is what's involved in obeying the Great Commission, the imperative of teaching all nations. And you notice the scope of the, of the commandment, of the imperative? All nations. It's not just, peop- it's not just people that are in your community. Um, it's not just people who are like you that are in your community. All nations, the, the idea here has more to do with um, ethnicities, people groups. We, we think of a nation and we think of a, a state with borders, right? We, we, we often um, consider ourselves, we're Americans because we all live within the borders of the United States of America, right? And that's a great unifying idea. That's a wonderful thing. But this has to do not, not so much with borders, but more with cultures, more with, more with traditions. Maybe you might even talk about languages, some. But we, we, we are not given a commission to reach the people only that are just like us with the gospel. We're to teach all nations. That means without discrimination. That means with, without, um, without excuses. I don't know how many ethnicities there are in the world. That's a, that's a hard thing to count up. Um, those that have tried seem, seem to, to have a difficult time. But I know that you don't have to go far away sometimes to, to run into people that aren't like you. You don't have to go beyond the borders of Edmond, Oklahoma. We, we talk about a, a multicultural nation, country. And that's, that's true. And you, you can like it or not like that. But it doesn't matter if, if you're trying to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. You can, you can argue if that's a good thing for a country to have many different cultures or not. But from a biblical standpoint, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that it exists and that we are responsible to reach all types of people. 
The second imperative um, helps, helps us a little bit also define what we need to be doing. And it's just as important that we obey it. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, are you there? <clears throat> I only have five passages, so you could use your hand like this. Each finger can hold a place. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what the imperative is here? It's preach. Preach. We, we're, we're, it's assumed that we're going to be going, but we have to preach the gospel. That means to verbally communicate the message of the gospel to every creature. That's what it says. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now, if, you're, if you leave the services this morning, you go home and you sit your, your pet dog down and start trying to explain to them the, the plan of salvation. That's not what we're talking about. But again, it's a, it's a term that points out the universality of the gospel. The gospel is for all people. The people for whom Christ died are the ones that need to hear the gospel. And the Bible declares that the the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And and Titus says that he he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so as long as as long as it's a they're a human being, they are the ones for whom Christ's blood was shed. And they're the ones to whom the church is responsible for preaching the gospel to. Okay? I know that you've heard it said before that preach the gospel and use words if necessary. That's not right. You have to use words to preach the gospel. It's a, it's a message. It's good news that God has made a way to reconcile man to God through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and has demonstrated his power and authority to forgive sins and to give life to all that will come upon him by the power of his resurrection. We have to preach the gospel message. We have to declare, you don't have to stand on the street corner and and preach it, but you do have to tell the people that God puts in your life. Don't suggest it to them. Don't, don't, uh, Don't skate around it. Understand, you're, you're obligated to share the message of the gospel. Love, right? So, two, two imperatives. And finally, the, the Great Commission is ensured by Christ's presence and power through the Holy Ghost. Back to Matthew, 18, Matthew 28. The last, the last verse in, in this text Again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. We've already touched on this, so I, I won't belabor the point. But here in the text, the, the promise of the Great Commission, the insurance that it will be accomplished, that it, it has everything behind it that's needed to see it through, is the, the promise that Christ will be present. As it's, as it's being performed with you always, even unto the end of the world. Again, um, in, ver- in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The promise is that the Holy Spirit will empower the church to be able to be his witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. These are things that we know. These are things that you've heard. We're remembering what is the Great Commission. And now we have to ask ourselves, again, something that we could probably answer right now. Why, why should we prioritize the Great Commission? Why prioritize it? Um, first of all, we should, priori- we should prioritize the Great Commission because 
duty demands it. Again, this isn't, this isn't uh, I'm not going to re-preach the, the point, but we, we, we see the Great Commission, and we understand that it is indeed a commandment. Amen? It's a commandment. It's an obligation laid upon the church. Hudson Taylor, uh, famous for, for uh, missionary work in China, said, The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a commandment to be obeyed. Uh, we're, we're, we think oftentimes in, in our, our current culture, we believe that we have the authority to determine the course of our lives. That we, we, we've been given the divine responsibility to somehow shape and mold our life into to that ideal vision that we have of ourselves. Friends, that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible reveals that God has a purpose for our lives and that, that he has expectations of his people and has given us clear commandments. We call Jesus Christ the Lord. That means he's the master. That, that's, that's like when I, when I call someone Lord, I am, I am saying that that person has authority over my life. And what they tell me to do, I'm obligated to do. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us a commandment, and we must follow it. It's not an option. It's not, it's not one choice that we can make among many. And, and don't, don't, don't mishear what I'm saying. We can choose not to obey God. We, we do it all the time. You know that we do. But it doesn't mean that it's right. That's the difference. There's, and there's consequences for not obeying God's commandments. <clears throat> another another uh, preacher said, the Great Commission will not be fulfilled with our spare time or our spare money. If, if we have a commandment, if duty demands that we prioritize the Great Commission, then we need to, we need to prioritize it with everything in our lives. We, we can't expect for it to, to be done or for our obligation to be met, maybe better to say that way, by just kind of throwing, throwing an odd minute into it here or there or thinking about it sometimes when we're on church on Sunday morning or, or giving God a tip in the offering plate. If it's a priority, then we need to treat it like a priority. <coughs> If I prioritize the Great commi- Commission, do you demands it, and love, love compels it. Okay, I won't, I won't make you turn to all these passages, but if the, if Brother Brandon in the back is fast enough, he can get him up there, or Brother Daniel, whoever's doing it. <coughs> if not, I'll give you a list if you want them. Um, love, love compels prioritizing the Great Commission. It's been said before um, by, by innumerable missionaries and pastors, missions is the heartbeat of God. Okay, uh, Someone else said that if you were to remove the idea of missions from the Bible, you'd be left with the covers. Okay, Th- This idea of redemption that is, is a, a theme of the Bible from cover to co- cover, is tied up with the idea of missions. And we, we read in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the, the parable of the, the woman who lost the coin, right? He says, likewise I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of angels, of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Can you imagine? Joy in the presence of the angels of God. That that doesn't mean that the angels are rejoicing, which it, maybe they are. I bet so. But it means that where the, pre, where the angels are in their presence, where the angels dwell around the throne of God, in his presence. So in their presence, there's rejoicing. There's rejoicing on the throne when one sinner repenteth. The, the, the love of the Father for, for 
the world for those that are, are separated from him is revealed in that the Father sent the Son, right? The, the heart of God is a heart of reconciliation towards those that have offended him. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us to love our enemies because that's the example that the Father has set to, to us. <clears throat> There's a very close connection between duty and desire for the Christian. Our love for Christ leads to Christ's love for the world to be our guiding force. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 19 says, We loved him because he first loved us. And John 14, 15 says, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, If ye love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. 2 Corinthians 5, which is 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Do you understand that duty demands it, but love, love compels it. Our, our love for God because of what he's done for us Just just meditate on what it means that God the Son stepped down out of heaven and took upon him the nature, the likeness of a man. And then when he was mistreated, when he was rejected, he didn't give up. He didn't bring judgment upon the world. He came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price. He gave it all. He laid it down so that we could have life. If you're sitting in the seats this morning, a born-again child of God, then you have experienced this love firsthand. Meditate on that. Think about it. What is there that that he would ask of you and I that we wouldn't be glad to do with that in mind? Is there, is there anything so, so great, so inconvenient, so embarrassing that it wouldn't be well worth the discomfort for the sake of doing what he's asked us to do? Every child, at some point or another, wants to please their parents. It should be like that for us, too. I, I, I want to do the will of my father. I don't, I don't always do it, but I want to. Love compels prioritizing the Great Commission. And finally, wisdom, wisdom commends it. <clears throat> Jim Elliot said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Right? And, and he gave it all, right? Jim Elliot did. He gave his life, that is. Basic, basic uh, financial wisdom teaches us that that uh, investing and in, in sacrificing things that are diminishing in value for something that will only increase in value and will never and will never fade away is a good a good exchange, right? 
Well, Jesus taught this. I'm sure that, that it's been covered um, already this month. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Then Jesus says in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the priority of God is, is his mission, his work that he has, he has unfolded from, from since the fall until today, the work of reconciliation, redemption. He will see it through. And for, for us, we're in this, this really unique, this highly privileged place, not because we're so smart, not, be, not because uh, we're, we're more clever than everyone else in the world, but simply because when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you became part of the family of God. And, and he has designed it to where you and I get to be part of his work. In other words, we can, we can invest our lives here and now and reap benefits for all of eternity. This is, this is a better, better retirement plan than anyone's ever heard of. Okay? This is, this is the, the wisest investment advice available upon planet Earth. Now we we got to maintain our families and provide for our needs and, and all these things. I'm not, I'm not talking right now about how we, how we need to, to manage all this out, but I want to tell you that prioritizing the Great Commission is a wise investment. It's a wise investment. You, you don't know what the end will be. <coughs> you know, there, there are people in this world who are willing to be intentional and, and to uh, plan and to work and to save just so that they can have a little bit longer time of not having to work a job and have more free time in, in their overall life. Right? You, you heard of this, the, the, the FIRE strategy? Um, financial independence, retire early. This is a real thing. People, they, they organize their lives in such a way to where they're able to, to live off of, you know, maybe around 30% of their income. And then they save 70% of it and invest it so that instead of waiting till they're 65 to, to travel and to enjoy all of the things that they think this, this world has to offer, they might could do it when they're 45. They're willing to, to not buy the best clothes, not go out to eat at the best restaurants, drive an older car, live in a smaller house. They're willing to do all of these things so that they might get 20 more, 20 more years. Listen, it's appointed unto man once to die. Th- what is this life? It's but a vapor. The, this, this isn't a, a, a Christian investment program. I'm just pointing out to you that people in the world get this, right? Trading, sacrificing in the present for what they, they hope to gain in the end. And it's not even sure for them. Friends, we're, we're, we're guaranteed by God himself that our labor is not in vain in the Lord, that God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. We have a tremendous opportunity before us. Wisdom commends that we prioritize the Great Commission. <clears throat> and, and finally, as we, as we really get close to wrapping up the sermon this morning, I want to let you know it is still morning. <clears throat> How can I engage the Great Commission? So we've, we've reviewed what is the Great Commission. We have, we've, we have uh, remembered why we ought to prioritize the Great Commission. And now, we're going to answer, how can I engage in the Great Commission? This is not an exhaustive list, but I want to suggest to you that this morning, um, 
the first thing we need to we need to address is we need to determine if we are a missionary or a mission field. Okay. There the the first thing that that must happen to engage in the great commission is to be a missionary. Not not a person going to a foreign field, but a, just a normal Christian, a church member, right? We, we've all been given the Great Commission as a ministry, as the, the purpose of the church. But you're either a missionary or you're a mission field this morning. That's just another way of saying that in the Bible, there's only two types of people. There are people for whom Christ has died and have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have been born again and are part of the family of God. Or there are people who the Lord Jesus Christ has died for their sins. And they have either, for varying reasons, they have not responded to the message of the gospel by turning from their own attempts at righteousness and the, the sins that they hold on to and putting their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe you are the mission field this morning. Maybe you are the person for whom Christ has died and you have yet to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done for you. Receive forgiveness of sins. Receive eternal life. Become part of the family of God. If that's you this morning, for whatever reason it's you, whether it's because you've you've heard the message time and time again and have put it off and now you just feel awkward and embarrassed because you've been in been in church world for so many years. It would be, it would be uh, awkward for you to to admit that you've just been playing along this time. Or if you've just come in for the first time and and you've never understood the gospel and now you you hear it, it's easy to understand. Christ died for your sins because you are a sinner in in danger of God's judgment. And he's risen from the, the dead and able to give you life if you come to him. Maybe you've just finally understood the message. Today's the day to put your trust in Christ. Not later, not another, not another service, not, not this afternoon. Today, now, now's the time. So that's the first thing you got to do. We got pri- to determine if you're missionaries or mission field. If you're mission field this morning, you need to. Take that step of faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If we're missionaries, then there's some other options for us. Maybe the first thing we need to take care of is we need to repent. And we're, we're, always, we're always looking at how we can move forward without addressing, addressing our failures. But the Bible makes it clear that the way forward is often back. We might need to, to admit, hey, I haven't, I haven't prioritized the Great Commission. I know better. I've, I've been prioritizing things of this world instead. We might just need to get things right in our hearts with the Lord today. And, and I trust that, that if we would do that, we would also, we would also um, realize that it's for us to dedicate our lives to the work of the Lord, to the will of God. You know that that it's not just missionaries who should surrender their lives to the will of God, professional missionaries, if you will. Each child of God, we we need to think about the love of Christ, and then we need we need to get to a place where we trust him enough to say, I want what you want for me regardless of what that means. No strings attached. None of, none of this, I'll do whatever you want, Lord, except all in. That's where we need to be if we want to engage in the Great Commission. We need to be all in. And that maybe that's, that's what needs to happen this morning. The Speaking of the, the church in Philippi, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, 
and unto us by the will of God. He's speaking about the offering that the, Phil- the Philippian church gave for the, the work in Jerusalem. They gave of themselves first. And out of their small resources, they gave what they could give. And it was, it was honored by God. We can engage in the Great Commission by going. You can divide the Great Commission into going and sending, right? There's going and there's sending. And I don't believe that there's some that go and some that send. I think that we all go and we all can have a part in sending. <coughs> we need to go. Are there, there are people in your sphere of influence that you need to go to, that you need to share, preach the gospel to. You need to be involved in outreaches in, in our community. We can't sit here and expect the people that we need to reach with the gospel to come to us. I'm, I'm so thankful any time a visitor comes to our church. That's such a blessing. And I hope that, I hope that, that people in our community feel welcome here. And, and, and that uh, they understand that we, we love them because of Christ. But my friends, there are so many people that are never going to come inside the church house. And they're not less worthy of hearing the gospel. They need to hear. And, they, and we need to go. Maybe... Maybe going for you means getting equipped to go. You know, the church exists to fulfill the Great Commission and to, to edify the saints so that they can go. And there's a tremendous opportunities for you. God has raised up leaders in this church, men who know the word of God, women who have, have experience as Christians and, and know the scripture that can help you if you feel like you would go, there's people that you want to reach, but you don't feel equipped. There's people here that can help. We need to invest the time, though. We need to be praying that God would give us direction in, our, in the ministries of our church. So we're, we're, we're working in Brazil. We thank you for your prayers and your support. And... Uh, and it's, it's a privilege to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and to represent Edmond Road Baptist Church. There's other places closer by that could use some, some ministry. And I don't know what that looks like. But I, I believe it's the will of God that we be going and making disciples, seeing other churches established. We're living in a dark world. We need more churches not less but we need more churches that are going to be engaged in in going and sending what what does god want edmund road baptist church to do about that they're sending we need to send we need to be involved in praying you know the the lord jesus christ commanded in matthew chapter 9 in verse 37, 38, then say Jesus unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he should send forth laborers into his harvest. We're involved in, in prayer. Prayer is a real part of, of missions, of the Great Commission. It's not, it's not something cute that the missionaries tell you when they come here. Hey, we, what we really need is for you to pray for us. That's not code word for what we really need is your money. It really is true. We need, we need people praying. Um, we, we need to be praying for more laborers. We need to be praying for uh, open doors. Um, that's a, you know, there's a whole other sermon there. I know I've already preached three sermons. Um, investing in training and preparing those who are called in a special way to go. You know, the, this church has a history of investing in, in men that will go. It's not something that we should, we should 
take for granted or take lightly, but let's continue on doing it intentionally. We can, we can be involved in sending by, by giving. Long time to get to the faith, pro- faith promise message. But I, I want to I wanna let you all know, I did an informal count. I think that we supported around 50 missionary projects as, as a church, somewhere around there. Um, each, each one of those projects represents an investment made for which, in the long term, there will be fruit that, that um, as the scripture says, fruit added to your account, right? That means that, that God knows about, your, about how we're investing, how you're investing as an individual, how we're investing as a church, and God is not going to forget that. And when, it, when, when we all give an account for the lives that Christ has, has given us as Christians, that's going to be in the accounting. A tremendous pleasure. We're, we, I expect to see people who, who will reach with the gospel because God gave me the opportunity to help someone else minister in a part of the world that I could never get to. I don't know when, when Edmund Road Baptist Church first started Faith Promise Missions, but as long as I've been a Christian for the last 24 years, I've had the privilege of being part of investing in, in missions through faith promise giving. Not, it's, it's not, uh, it's the best of all the worlds, right? We, we, get to, we get to deal with God and ask him, what does he want us to give? What would God have me to do? And we get to make that commitment with him and watch and see how he provides for that. But we also get to do it together, right? All, my, my individual gift, maybe that doesn't do that much. But when we put it all together, it's able to accomplish a lot in the world. You, you make a commitment financially, yes, but you also should make a commitment prayerfully. Your missionaries need your money, but they need your prayers. And they also need your fellowship. Maybe this year, as you pray about what the Lord would have you do, what he'd have you to give or allow you to be part of giving, maybe a better way to think about it. You might also ask how you could, how you could get more involved in the missionaries that, that we have a part in their work. How can, how can we pray for them better? Is there a way that you can encourage them? I know that this morning as we come to the end of the, the service, we're going to take the offering and, and uh, take up the faith promise cards. And everyone, I hope, has prayed about what the Lord would have them to do. But as, as you give, make a commitment to not, not only give financially, but give of yourself. Give of your life for the Great Commission.